Good evening, everybody. I'm nervous about touching this microphone tonight. It might ring and give the wrong signal. Well, I hope that you've had a very good day. I'm continuing to enjoy and appreciate North Queensland and this camp meeting. I have the privilege of attending camp meetings in various parts of Australia and New Zealand and I must confess, as I've said to some of you, that the, this camp meeting in North Queensland is very special and very unique. And we appreciate very much the opportunity of being with you. During this week, we are tracing footprints. And I've enjoyed these little segments of the footprints that have been presented to us night by night of the pioneers who came to this country and to this state. But we've been going back a little earlier because I'm concerned that we understand why those pioneers came. And I think of the Andersons coming from Scandinavia and out here to a very lonely existence, not even being able to speak the language, coming with a new faith. You know, I can understand their discouragements. And uh, as we think about the, the sacrifice the motivation that brought these people to, to share and want to build up something that in those days was so very, very small. And I rejoice as I think about what the Lord has done and as I hear these stories of ADRA and the work of the Sanitarium Health Food Company and all the other aspects that the Lord has raised up to help project a message and proclaim a message that Jesus is coming soon, a Christ-centered message, I really rejoice. And I, I marvel at what the Lord has done. But tonight we want to proceed with our tracing of footprints. But let's just spend a little time in review. On, on Friday evening, we traced the great Advent movement in the 1840s. The expectation that Jesus was coming soon. Those pioneering Adventists based their belief on a text of scripture. It's a well-known text. And in Daniel chapter eight, that tremendous chapter in the center of the book of Daniel, with its accompanying explanation in Daniel chapter 9. In verse 14, the, the prophecy came to a climax as Daniel heard an angel say, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Unto 2,300 days or years as they understood it, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. A little further down we read that the angel Gabriel came and said to Daniel concerning this prophecy, understand son of man that the vision refers to the time of the end. There are some who think that these 2,300 days refer to 2,300 literal days, but evidently they miss what the angel Gabriel says that this vision would refer to the time of the end. It would reach down across the centuries to the time just before the second coming of Christ. And a little further down as the angel Gabriel again speaks to Daniel about this tremendous prediction. In verse 26, the angel says, and the vision of those evenings and mornings, the 2,300 evenings and mornings which was told is true. And so what motivated those pioneers to study this great prophecy was that the angel that stood in the very presence of God, Gabriel himself, affirmed that this vision was true. What authority did they have for believing it? You'll remember that we looked at the great Baptist preacher William Miller and how he had believed that the sanctuary was the earth and that the cleansing of the sanctuary referred to in Daniel 8 verse 14 must refer to the cleansing of the earth and the church at the second coming of Christ. And hundreds of ministers joined him. And thousands were waiting for the advent of the Lord in 1844. But as we've noticed over these last few evenings, dear friends, that glad reunion turned into such a bitter disappointment when Jesus did not come. They had misunderstood the prophecy. They had understood the time was right, but the event at the end was not right. But last night we noticed that they weren't alone in suffering a disappointment because of their misunderstanding of Bible prophecy. You remember we went back to the days of the disciples. They too misunderstood Bible prophecy. They too thought the time was right. The Messiah had come on time. But the event that they thought would come at the end was wrong. 
just as the Adventists in 1844. But last night we reviewed the experience of Hiram Edson and his friends and the insights that they came to as they studied that great chapter again and that verse. Under 2,300 days, they understood that part well. But then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, is what the prophecy had said. Since the, the verse had pointed to the cleansing of the sanctuary as the great event to occur at the end of the 2,300 years, Edson and others turned their attention to God's word. What was meant by the cleansing of the sanctuary? What sanctuary was referred to? If it wasn't the earth, what was the sanctuary to be cleansed at the end of the 2,300 years? As I've already mentioned, dear friends, they had no doubt in their minds about the significance of this prophecy. Because Gabriel is the one concerning who explains it. You know, it's very interesting to me that the Bible only records four occasions when the angel Gabriel comes from heaven to earth. There are two in the Old Testament and two in the New Testament. Let me test your knowledge. What are the two occasions in the New Testament when the angel Gabriel, the angel who stands in the presence of God, comes down to the earth with an important message? What are they in the New Testament? Right, to announce the, to Mary the birth of the Messiah, the Son of God. What an important event. What's the other occasion? What's the other occasion? Where Gabriel is mentioned by name. There may be other times when an angel, it could be Gabriel, but mentioned by name. What's the other occasion? To announce the birth of John the Baptist to his parents. Two very important occasions. There's only two occasions where Gabriel comes from heaven to earth in the Old Testament. One of them is in Daniel 8, the prophecy of the 2,300 years. The other one, Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, the very next chapter, when the angel Gabriel returns and explains the vision of the 2,300 years. Why do I think that's important, my friends? Because the angel Gabriel comes to earth with a message only when it is very, very significant and very, very important. As they studied this great chapter and other parts of the Bible, they were to discover that this great work pointed to a work of judgment. And tonight I want to turn our attention to something that is sometimes misunderstood, but something which greatly concerns every one of us here in this tent tonight. But you'll notice that I've entitled it His Judgment, Our Confidence. And I want to dwell on that last word. As we think of this, what was the sanctuary that was to be cleansed at the end of the 2,300 years? They turned their attention to that first of all. They began an intense period of Bible study. And they saw, and they tell us clearly and distinctly, that as a result of their Bible study, there was an earthly sanctuary built by Moses and later replaced by Solomon's glorious temple. And as they studied the outline of the earthly sanctuary, the tent in Moses' time, and also the great temple of Solomon, they saw so many similarities. The holy place and the most holy place and the furniture that was placed in both apartments. But then as they continued to study their Bibles, they also noticed that these two sanctuaries were constructed according to the pattern of the heavenly. That was something that was almost a new revelation to them, though others had discovered the same thing a long time before they did. That these two sanctuaries, the earthly, was not just built by Moses out of what he thought a sanctuary should be like. But you remember that we are told in the book of Exodus, and it's repeated in Hebrews, that they were instructed to make that earthly sanctuary according to the pattern of the one in heaven. Words like pattern, a copy, a shadow are used in the book of Hebrews to describe the relationship between the earthly and the heavenly. But then too, they saw that there was a twofold ministry in the earthly sanctuary, represented by the holy place and the most holy place. And so we have these pieces of furniture, the candlestick, that magnificent piece of, of candlestick providing light reflected on the gold walls of the sanctuary. The beautiful curtain that protected the most holy place 
In the holy place there was the table of showbread and the small altar of incense. And then of course behind the curtain there was that sacred piece of furniture, the Ark of the Covenant with its Shekinah glory, the manifestation of the presence of God between the two cherubim. But then they also noticed that the priests, as they studied the great books of Exodus and Leviticus, ministered daily in the courtyard and in the holy place, bringing forgiveness and atonement for the sinner. And so they would come into the courtyard, bringing their sacrifices, met by the priest, and as we mentioned last night, there was a little ritual there that was so significant because it pointed forward to Jesus. And then the sanctuary itself, the main tent with its holy place and its most holy place. And the temple, that rather the cloud that abode over the most holy place when God's presence was manifested between the, uh, the two cherubim. But then they also noticed as they continued to study that the high priest ministered once a year in the most holy place on the Day of Atonement, blotting out the record of confessed sin and cleansing the sanctuary. A very special day. Where did they find those conclusions in Scripture? I want to just read you a couple of texts tonight in the book of Leviticus and if you have your Bibles with you would you turn to Leviticus chapter 4 and let's notice verse 32. What did they discover was the daily service? What happened every day in ancient Israel in relation to the sanctuary and in the relation to the forgiveness of sins? In Levit Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 32 we read this about the sinner who comes to the sanctuary. If he brings a lamb as his sin offering, he shall bring a female without blemish. Then he shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and kill it as a sin offering at the place where they kill the burnt offering. The priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger, put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour all the remaining blood at the base of the altar. He shall remove all its fat as the fat of the lamb is removed from the sacrifice of the peace offering. Then the priest shall burn it on the altar according to the offerings made by fire to the Lord. So the priest shall make atonement for his sin that he has committed and it shall be forgiven him. What an interesting ritual, but we mustn't miss the significance of it all, my friends. They came into that temple courtyard that we noticed on the screen, and there they brought their lamb, they put their hands over the head of the lamb, and then the priest, and the lamb was with, to be without blemish, then the priest would offer the knife, and the sinner, as we noticed last night, would take the life of the lamb. And then with the blood, it says, so atonement shall be made for the sin that he's committed and it shall be forgiven him. Oh, my friends, what a picture of Jesus. A lamb without blemish. No marks or defects on that lamb. But as the sinners watched that blood drip into the basin, it was the blood that brought the cleansing. It was the blood that brought atonement, an interesting word, at one reconciliation between God and the sinner. But it was accomplished through the blood. And in that daily ritual that went on day by day, it was pointing forward to that time when the Lamb of God would shed his blood and the sinner would go free and be forgiven and atonement once again would be made. Oh, my friends, as I think of that forgiveness, I want to remind us all tonight that is so real to you and to me that that forgiveness, in that forgiveness, the sinner was treated as if he'd never sinned at all. You remember that David prayed that, his, that the Lord would forgive his sins and separate them from us as far as the east is from the west. And I've always been thankful that he didn't make a mistake in his directions, that the Holy Spirit guided him as he wrote that. Why? Does it make a difference if he had said that God separates your sin and mine from us as far as the north is from the south? Would that have made a difference? You don't seem very confident. It, uh, it would make a terrible difference, a tr tremendous difference, wouldn't it? Think of the difference. There's a, a fixed distance between north and south. You go north and you cross over the North Pole and if you keep going in the straight same direction, what direction are you now going? 
south and you go south and go across the south pole but keep on going in the same direction and what direction are you now going north but if you go west young man if you go west around the globe you can go west and keep on going west and it go around the globe a million times and you're still going west because the distance between east and west compared to the distance between north and south is infinite and oh my friends the sinners in the Old Testament enjoyed the assurance as David stated that his sins were separated from him as far as the east is from the west and that was accomplished that forgiveness and atonement were provided by the blood of an innocent sacrifice in that holy place ministry but then the Bible also mentioned that because there were two apartments in Leviticus chapter 16 it describes the services in the most holy place you remember I know I'm revising this with you tonight but it's laying down an important understanding that I want to stress as we proceed that there in that most holy place with the Shekinah presence of God with the angels with the sacred law of God in that most holy piece of furniture the high priest could only enter into that you'll remember only once a year on a special day the day of atonement the day when the ancient sanctuary would be cleansed of all of its confessed sin and in Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 29 we read this this shall be a statute forever for you in the seventh month on the tenth day of the month you shall afflict your souls do no work at all whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you for on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord a strange verse because I thought the sinner was, was forgiven the moment, the day that he came and brought that little, uh, that sacrifice and he took the life of that lamb. Didn't the Bible say that atonement was then made for him? He was brought close to God, reconciled to God and his sin was forgiven. Why then was there needed another day, a day, tenth day of the seventh month that came once every year, it says, to cleanse the people from their sins. My friends, they were cleansed, they were forgiven, they were made right with God the moment they brought their sin and confessed it, placing their hands over the head of the Lamb. As far as they were concerned, their sin was separated from them as far as the east is from the west. But the record of their confessed sin was marked on the horns of that altar in the courtyard. The priest would take the blood and then sprinkle the blood on the horns of that altar. So as far as the sanctuary was concerned, there was the record of the confessed and forgiven sin. As far as the sinner was concerned, his sin was forgiven. He was cleansed and made right. But once a year, according to scripture, that's those sins that had been transferred into the sanctuary and away from the sinner were finally blotted out in that special service that came once a year and as we think of the most holy place ministry again the sins that had been confessed and transferred to the sanctuary were finally blotted out and the sanctuary was cleansed by the blood again of an innocent sacrifice and that's something we must not miss what brought them final blotting out of sin what brought them the, the, the rejoicing that all the sins of Israel for the year had been taken away and transferred to the head of the scapegoat and the scapegoat led away out into the wilderness it was the blood at each step of the way a sacrifice without blemish had enabled the sin to be completely removed from the sanctuary and as a result of the services on that special day the sanctuary was restored to its rightful place it was cleansed made right with no record of sin remaining but my friends since the earthly was made according to the pattern of the heavenly as we look to the earthly we see that God was giving them a, a visual aid of all that Jesus would accomplish on behalf of his people in accomplishing the plan of, of salvation since the earthly was a shadow of the heavenly since the earthly was a copy of the heavenly since the earthly was made according to the pattern of the heavenly 
those two great divisions that came every year evidently were to point to two great divisions in the ministry of Jesus Christ our Saviour in the heavenly sanctuary. They saw that Jesus at his ascension had begun his work as our high priest and you remember the text that we noticed last night in the book of Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 1 and 2 when the writer of Hebrews expressed it this way now this is the main point of the things we're saying we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man Oh, my friends, it was a, a, a real new insight to those pioneers. If the earthly foreshadowed the heavenly, if the work of the priests in the earthly pointed to the work of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary, there would come a time when the heavenly also would be cleansed, restored to its rightful state, and the sins that had been forgiven would ultimately be blotted out and all sin destroyed out of this universe. That's what was to happen at the end of the 2,300 years. The time had come for the final work of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary prior to the, his glorious return. And what was it that brought atonement both in the earthly and in the heavenly? What was it that brought atonement both in the daily service and in the yearly service? My friends, we must never forget it was the blood of an innocent sacrifice. And therefore I bring you this message tonight, my friends, that we must never forget that it was Jesus and his death, the cross, the Lamb of God, lay at the very heart of the sanctuary service throughout its operation. It was the blood of the sacrifice that brought assurance, brought reconciliation with God. The whole of the sanctuary was a provision of glorious grace it was demonstrating God's love for sinners, pointing forward to that day when Jesus would come and bring cleansing and forgiveness and reconciliation and atonement for the people of the world. Oh, my friends, what a revelation of God's love and grace is found in the sanctuary. And in the years that followed, after 1844, as Edson and his friends and others joined them, continuing to study the subject of the sanctuary and its cleansing, one of the texts that they examined was this one. It's found in Leviticus chapter 23 and verses 26 and onwards. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Also the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it's the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person, and listen to these words, for any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from among his people." As they dug down into the book of Leviticus, they discovered that for the ten days prior to the Day of Atonement, and on the Day of Atonement itself, it was to be a time of affliction of soul, a time of heart searching, a seeking of God to make sure all sins had been transferred into the sanctuary so that everything was right between you and God. But according to this scripture, if that was not done, if there was no heart searching, if there was no making sure that everything was right between you and God, then the individual was cut off from God's people with sins unconfessed upon their hearts. That is why for thousands of years the Hebrew people have considered the day of atonement as a yearly day of judgment. Jesus, our high priest. But look at what Jewish authorities have talked about the day of atonement. I found these quotations interesting and I share them with you tonight. In a very well-known Jewish authority, Paul Hershon, in his book Treasures of the Talmud, he says this about the day of atonement.
Even the angels, we are told in the ritual, are seized with fear and trembling. They hurry to and fro, saying, Behold, the day of judgment has come. Listen to that language. Here in this Jewish authority, when the day of atonement comes, they say, Behold, the day of judgment has come. The day of atonement is the day of judgment. In the Jewish Encyclopedia, Volume 2, and the article Day of Atonement, God, seated on his throne to judge the world, openeth the books of record. Angels shudder, saying, This is the day of judgment. On the day of atonement it is sealed, Who shall live and who are to die? And in the Holy Day prayer book for the Yom Kippur, and Yom Kippur is the Hebrew for Day of Atonement, it says, the great shofar, the ram's horn, is sounded. A gentle whisper is heard. The angels, quaking with fear, declare, the day of judgment is here. Do you understand the significance of this? We need to remember again that the earthly was an illustration of the heavenly. That the earthly day of atonement pointed to the heavenly day of atonement when God would enter into his work and again the angels would say the day of judgment has come and so those early pioneers that came to North Queensland my friends brought a message that the day of judgment has come was that too found in scripture you'll remember that when the Apostle Paul was preaching to the Athenians the philosophers in Acts chapter 17, he spoke to them in verse 31 with these words, because God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. My friends, just as certainly as Jesus was raised from the dead, so there is a day of judgment and that judgment is committed into the hands of him who was to be raised from the dead. Is there a description in scripture about this day of judgment? Oh, can I remind us all tonight of that very thrilling description? I've often wondered how artists would portray it that's found in Daniel chapter 7 where there's the greatest description of the day of judgment anywhere to be found in, in, in the word of God. And in Daniel 7 verse 9, think of these words. Imagine what scene Daniel is painting as he describes this day of judgment this way. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow. The hair of his head was white like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated. Some translations say the judgment was set. And the books were opened. What a picture. As Daniel was overcome by the scene of the Ancient of Days, God the Father seated on the throne, surrounded by a hundred million angels. And here's a great judgment scene. And it's very clear if you read in Daniel chapter 7 that this judgment comes before the second coming of Christ. It is a pre-advent judgment. And then as those early pioneers turned to the book of Revelation... They came to Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. And here was their role in history. Then I saw, John says, an angel, another angel, flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every tr nation, tribe, tongue and, tongue and language. John sees a mighty message, a preaching of the gospel, just before Christ comes. And this message is to go to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. That's what motivated those pioneers to come to Queensland. And as the angel says with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Almost the same words written into the Jewish encyclopedia concerning the day of judgment. 
The day of judgment has come and as that great hour struck in heaven at, in that mighty year at the end of the 2,300 years, as the mighty judgment began in heaven, as Jesus turned his work to that final work, and that's good news, he's now engaged in the final work, bringing the final sin problem to a close. God was going to raise up a people. Oh, they began so small, my friends. They began out of a disappointment. But that small group of people were eventually to go, according to this prophecy, to every kindred, nation, tongue and people. And I rejoice as I hear what's happening today with television and radio. And I think what God has accomplished in 140 years. The hour of his judgment has come. Was the message to go to the world in the setting of the preaching of the gospel. Oh, what a picture. As we think of those three angels symbolizing this mighty last appeal of God to the world, but then what are the decisions of the judgment? You'll remember that in Daniel chapter 7, the Bible tells us there are two decisions of the judgment. One is upon the little horn, that strange figure with the eyes of a man and a mouth that speaks great things. Pointing to that great apostate religious system that was to arise up into the world after Jesus came. It was to be a judgment upon the little horn first of all. And why is the judgment on the little horn brought to view in that judgment in Daniel 7? For a number of reasons. It was to be a judgment on a religious system that has spoken boastful words against God. It's a judgment upon a religious system that is described as making war on the people of God and persecuting them. It's a judgment upon a religious system that has tried to change the very law of God and the set times that come in that law. It's a judgment upon a system that it has exalted itself to the prince of the host and it is a judgment upon a system that has brought low the place of Christ's sanctuary yes that comes up in the judgment and my friends as I look back upon history and I realize that this great power would also throw truth to the ground God is going to have the final word when I think of the martyrs that have died over the last thousand years, when I think of those who are dying today as martyrs, is there, can there not be a time when God is going to right the wrongs of earthly courts? That those who have gone into their graves as the scum of the earth, there is a judgment that's needed in the making of, of earthly records right? My friends, I've had the privilege of standing in the Waldensian Valleys where so many thousands of people died for their faith. I have stood in the Grey Friars Church in Edinburgh in Scotland and over in the corner of this little churchyard is an impressive martyr's memorial that speaks about 40,000 people being slain in Edinburgh for their commitment to the truth. I have stood in the square in Oxford in England and looked at the Martyrs Memorial in the centre of that great city to those three great churchmen who died for their faith in the 1500s. And as I thought about those words in Revelation 6 where they cry out, How long, O Lord, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Oh, my friends, there is a judgment upon a system that is professedly Christian but has attacked God's truth and his sanctuary. But what is of far more relevance and meaning to you tonight, my friends, is that the book of Daniel chapter 7 also speaks about a judgment for the saints. And I read in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 22, it says... I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Why is there a judgment in favor of the saints? Oh, my friends, what I want to share with you tonight before I close 
is that though the Bible very clearly affirms that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, this is not bad news. It is good news. It is good news. I know that many Adventists can't really mean when they sing blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Because many of us fear the judgment. We fear that if we're not absolutely perfect in character, we will not pass the judgment. There are many who are filled with self-doubt because they fear that they're never going to live as perfectly as a Christian ought to enable them to get through the judgment. And I've met many Adventist Christians who have almost given up trying to reach the standard they have in their own mind because they say, I'll never pass the judgment. They have no assurance in Christ in this judgment. But oh my friends, what's the wonderful news about the judgment? What chance do you and I have of being acquitted in this judgment? Every chance. Why? Because Jesus is there. Do you remember that we read earlier that text? That God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. It is good news, my friends. And may I say to you tonight, if there is anybody in this tent who fears to have confidence in the judgment, the judgment in Daniel 7 was made in favour of the saints. And the saints are those who have committed their lives into the hands of Jesus. And when that judgment comes, my friends, and the Bible does say that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that's not bad news. Because if Jesus is there as your saviour, if you have committed your life to him, if you are abiding in him, my friends, it is good news that he's going to step forward and say, the blood, remember the role of the blood in the Old Testament sanctuary? When the sinner has his sins forgiven and it was the blood that enabled his sins to be forgiven, even on that solemn day of atonement, what did the high priest do to blot out the record of sin and leave the sanctuary clean? It was the blood of the animal that was cleansed and that was sacrificed and my friends so long as you and I are hiding in the blood so long as we have allowed day by day our lives to be washed clean in the blood of the lamb we have nothing to fear in that judgment you know there's a wonderful illustration as I close tonight I want to read to you a wonderful illustration that encourages me so much concerning our standing and the confidence that you and I can have in the judgment it's found in the little book of Zechariah. Toward the end of the Old Testament, we have Zechariah 3. And I want you to listen to what the prophet wrote. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. I want you to get the picture here. Here is a picture of the high priest standing before Jesus himself the angel, as he's described as the angel or the messenger of the Lord and Satan is standing there ready to accuse the high priest to oppose him why? we read on and the Lord said to Satan the Lord rebuke you Satan the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you is this not a brand plucked from the fire? now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments why is the high priest pictured as clothed with filthy garments? Because in the high priest is Israel. And because of the sins of Israel, the high priest is pictured as being clothed with the filthy garments of sin. And he's standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have remo removed your iniquity from you and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by. My friends, Satan knows every sin that you have committed. And there are times that come into our lives when he reminds us of the sins that we have committed. He is always there to oppose us, to remind us that we are clothed in filthy garments. 
He accuses us of our sinfulness. He comes to you when you are low and reminds you of your unfaithfulness to God. But we still don't fear the judgment because God is always predisposed towards our vindication because of the cross to which we cling. That vindicates us in the Lamb's book of life. And my friends, I want to say to you tonight that the judgment does not determine if you and I are going to be saved or not, as I hear some people say. It merely ratifies our standing in Christ. It affirms our salvation because the righteousness with which we will then be clothed is not our righteousness but Christ's. Then will be fulfilled that glorious text in Jeremiah chapter 50. In those days and at that time, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for and there shall be none and the sins of Judah but they shall not be found. Wonderful news. But did you know something about Zechariah chapter 3? Z Zechariah 3 has special significance for the people of God in the closing up of the great heavenly day of atonement, the day of judgment. You know, there's a chapter, and I, I, I want to bring you these words before I close tonight, my friends. There's a chapter in Testimonies for the Church that is called Joshua and the Angel. And I noticed that Clifford Goldstein, one of our prolific writers, said recently he wishes that he could require of every Seventh-day Adventist that they should read this chapter. Because if you have a wrong idea of the judgment, or even if you think that Ellen White presents us a wrong view of the judgment, I want to encourage you to read this and therefore notice these words from that chapter, and I would encourage you all to read the whole chapter. Zechariah's vision of Joshua and the angel applies with peculiar force to the experience of God's people in the closing scenes of the great heavenly day of atonement. Why? Because Satan is there in the Day of Atonement pointing to our filthy garments. Just as he stood by Joshua and pointed to oppose him and critique him, the, the high priest, so he points to our filthy garments, our defective characters. He presents their weakness and folly, their sins of ingratitude, their unlikeness to Christ, which has dishonoured their Redeemer. And my friends, let's be honest tonight, he can do that with all of us. Satan is there, he knows a record of our sins. He can point out in each one of our lives our weaknesses, our folly, our sins of ingratitude, our unlikeness to Christ, which has dishonoured Jesus. And Satan, the adversary, asks, she goes on to say, are these the people who are to take my place in heaven? And he continues, while they profess to obey the law of God, have they kept its precepts? Have they not been lovers of self more than lovers of God? Have they not placed their own interests above his service? Have they not loved the things of the world? Look at the sins that have marked their lives. Behold their selfishness, their malice, their hatred toward one another. Oh, my friends, what a list. And Satan can do that of the people of God. He can do it of all of us here in this tent tonight. He has a category of all of our falling short of the perfection of Jesus. And he says, are these the people who are going to take my place in heaven? You cast me out of heaven and you're going to put in the place of me and my angels these people with their ingratitude and their folly? Remember, this is the high priest clothed with filthy garments representing the filthy garments and the sins of the people of God. But notice what follows. But while the followers of Christ have sinned, they have not given themselves over to the control of evil. They have put away their sins and have sought the Lord in humility and contrition. And the divine advocate, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And the divine advocate pleads in their behalf. And then notice, we cannot answer the charges of Satan against us. Christ alone can make an effectual plea in our behalf. 
he is able to silence the accuser with arguments. And what are the arguments? What are the ultimate arguments that in spite of the category of our sins that Satan can bring up before us? The arguments are founded not upon our merits, but on the merits of Jesus. That's why we must cling to him, my friends. And if we do, that's why the judgment is good news. That's why we can have confidence when he speaks on our behalf. Jesus, our advocate, presents an effectual plea in behalf of all who by repentance and faith have committed their souls, the keeping of their souls to him. He pleads their cause and vanquishes their accuser with the mighty arguments of Calvary. Oh, my dear friends, that is our confidence. And because Jesus came and died and paid in full the penalty for all of our sins, Satan may come and accuse us as he is the accuser of the brethren. But oh my dear brother, my sister, we have in that judgment scene finally when he pronounces favor in favor of the saints. It's not because we have not sinned, but it's because sin as sinners we have had him proclaim on our behalf his merits, his righteousness, and the mighty arguments of Calvary. I know of no greater argument that I can set before your heart tonight than if you cling to the mighty arguments of Calvary, if you cling to the cross, you have nothing to fear in the judgment. That is why the Apostle Paul could write, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. May I make an earnest and urgent appeal to each one of us tonight, my friends. Are you sure that you are in Christ Jesus? If you are, you have nothing to fear in the judgment. Your confidence is in him who paid the supreme price for your salvation. You know, George Wilson in the early 1800s was condemned to death because he had robbed a mail train and threatened the life of the train driver. As a result of his crime, he was placed in jail. And while in jail, the President of the United States considered his case and granted him a free pardon. And so one day they came to the cell of George Wilson with the pardon of the President of the United States in their hand. They thrust it through the bars, but George Wilson refused to accept the pardon. And the jailer said, if you refuse to accept the pardon, you must die. But George Wilson's attorneys obtained a stay of execution because they said, you cannot execute a man who has been pardoned by the President of the United States. And you know, my friends, that case went to the Supreme Court of the United States. Would George Wilson die or would he live when he had been granted a pardon by the President of the United States? Here is the decision of the court. A pardon is a deed to the validity of which delivery is essential and delivery is not complete without acceptance. It may even be rejected. And if it be rejected, we have discovered no power in this court to force it on him. It may be supposed that no being condemned to death would reject a pardon, but the rule must be the same. Oh, my dear friends, all of us tonight have been pardoned by the King of the Universe. But it will never be forced upon us. It may be supposed that no being condemned to death of all, as all of us are would ever reject a pardon. But the rule must be the same. And George Wilson died. The only man to ever die in the history of the United States who was pardoned by the President of the United States. 
Oh my friends, a pardon has been offered to each one of us. We have the one standing at the right hand of the King of the Universe who has and should have our case in his hands. May we accept it and may we find confidence tonight that if our case is in the hands of Jesus, we are secure because of the arguments of Calvary. My dear friends, there's one hymn tonight that I have chosen that I want you to sing. This is a hymn a little bit like last night that I, I just want you to sing it with conviction. It's an old, old hymn, but oh, what wonderful words. It was written by Frank Belden, and I don't know whether you know that Frank Belden was the nephew of Ellen White, and he had the marvellous ability to sit in the choir at the Battle Creek Church and while he was listening to the sermon, he would write a ver some verses on the sermon and then put it to music. And at the end of the sermon, he would stand up and sing it. And in 1899, he did just that with this hymn. He'd heard a wonderful sermon on righteousness by faith and our case in the judgment. And so he wrote the words, look upon Jesus. Sinless is he. Father, impute his life unto me. My life of scarlet, my sin and woe, cover with his life, whiter than snow. Cover with his life, whiter than snow, fullness of his life, then shall I know. My life of scarlet, my sin and woe, cover with his life, whiter than snow. And that's the experience that will give us confidence in the judgment. Number 412, these wonderful words. Let's sing them with feeling tonight as we close. Let's stand as we sing. Look upon Jesus, sinless is he. Father, impute his life unto me. My life of scarlet, my sin and woe, cover with his life, whiter than snow. Cover with his life, whiter than snow. Fullness of his life, then shall I know. My life of scarlet, my sin and woe, than snow. Deep are the wounds transgression has made. Red are the stains my soul is afraid. Oh, to be covered, Jesus, with me. Set from the Lord that now judges me. Notice the words of the fourth stanza and the four great words of the Christian faith that are found there. Reconciled by his death for my sin, justified by his life pure and clean, sanctified by obeying his word, 
glorified when returneth my Lord. Let's sing this last stanza and then when we come to that final chorus, let me really hear you sing with conviction those wonderful words. Reconciled by His life for my sin, justified by His life pure and clean, sanctified by obeying His word, glorified when returneth my Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you for the assurance that though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And that's only possible because of the blood of Jesus that can cleanse us from all of our sin. Oh Lord, we thank you for that invitation that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Lord, we pray tonight that in that great final judgment scene when you come to number your people, that each one of us here tonight might have the assurance and the confidence that Jesus can step forward and say there is no record of sin against his name because he has permitted my blood to cleanse him from sin, to clothe him with my perfect righteousness. Lord, let his name remain in that book of life and at last, may the gates of the city of God open up before each one of your people here tonight, together with our family, our friends, those for whom we labour and pray. Oh Lord, I pray that you will give us that confidence that we may have in that final great hour, because we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.